Our lecture today is going to be on fauvism, cubism, and futurism. And we'll begin with the earliest of those three, which is fauvism. The time we really see this prevalent is from 1903 to about 1908. And this is an example of a fauvist painting. You can see how bright and colorful it is, how exciting it is, and most importantly, the use of arbitrary color, meaning that the colors really aren't correct. Now, the leader of the fauves is Henri Matisse, one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And the name fauve comes to us from the translation of Wild Beast. During the very first Fauvist exhibition, the Autumn Salon of 1903, you can imagine those Fauvist paintings in a gallery, very bright, very loud, the use of complementary colors, and someone wheels in and places in the very center of the exhibition a 15th century sculpture by Donatello. And there's an art critic walking around the room at this time, and in his critique, he writes that Donatello is surrounded by wild beasts. And the art critic, his name is Vosilis, very famous art critic, and the name stuck. So this group of artists use the word fauvism. Fauvism, as I mentioned earlier, as we looked at the image, deals with what's called arbitrary color or subjective color. Now, up until the modern era, everyone used local color, the color items are. We don't have to go and check. For instance, bananas are yellow, the grass is green, the sky is blue. During Impressionism, we talked about perceptual or optical color, the idea that color is derived from light, and if light changes throughout the day, the color of the object must also change. But now we're at arbitrary color. And this is where the artist himself or herself gets to decide on what color an object is. That apple can be yellow or green or brown or violet. The sky can be turquoise or mauve. The idea is that the artist gets to choose it whether it's for design reasons or for maybe even emotive reasons. The canvases of these works are also very raw, meaning that they're untreated. There's no gesso or priming agent put on the canvas first before the paint is put on. And we'll just look at a couple other Fauvist images. Again, you can really note the excitement of this arbitrary type of color. Particularly here, you can see the unfinished quality of the painting. You can literally see large swatches of the canvas through the trees or even the hillside in the lower left-hand corner. And you can imagine the uh, disdain from the academy painters at how childlike this is, how sketch-like of a quality this is. Now, the leader of the Fauves is Henri Matisse, and even though a lot of people won't say it, he was definitely a friend of Picasso's. You'll hear a lot of people say that they were enemies, that they always argued, and so on, and they absolutely did argue. But when it came down to it, and particularly at the very end of Matisse's life, there was no one that promoted Matisse as much as Picasso did. Now, in the overall scheme of 20th century art, Matisse is going to be in the top five or the top ten. When we look at pre-end of World War II, we're looking at he may have been the second most important artist behind Picasso. He created so many techniques and ideas that are the basis for future art movements. He's so incredibly important. He worked in a variety of mediums, including paintings, sculptures, textiles, and late in life, he worked on cutouts. His early work is absolutely perfect. It's very academic. This painting is done in linear perspective. It uses techniques such as chiaroscuro 
and it's purchased along with this next work by the French government. In fact, today both of these paintings hang in government houses. But we can see that, especially in this painting, Matisse sets the textile off kilter up top of the cabinet there in the left-hand corner of the room. We start to see that slow moving toward disorder or the avant-garde. Everything is not perfect in this painting. In fact, the figure itself isn't even looking forward. We just see her back. Matisse constantly used textiles in his work. He came from a textile producing town in northern France, and textiles are something he always implemented throughout his works. And especially with this painting here, with the textile askew, we look back and as if he's paying homage to the artist Chardin, who would also use textiles in his work, the work at the right called The Skate, we have the textile all kind of crumpled up along the right-hand side, and further along the right-hand side, it's laid out perfectly. It's like it was just tossed aside to put down these other uh, shells and, and fish and such. With Matisse's painting, we literally want to reach out into the painting to straighten up that textile so that the painting does look perfect. But by the early 1900s, we have Matisse in his formidable style of fauvism. He's the first artist that does this, where we have these, again, bright, loud colors. These colors are also applied with a short, quick brush stroke. And this painting in particular, you can barely kind of make out the images. There's about four or five uh, female figures here that are nude. There's one figure off to the left that is fully dressed, and that is the figure of his wife. This is another painting of his wife, and you can tell right from these just two images that they did not have the best or the happiest of marriages. Um, the green stripe, sometimes called Madame Matisse, has his wife uh, looking off, her, off to the right, and you have this stripe of color going down the center of her face. And they lived apart uh, probably more than they lived together. Matisse uh, many times just deciding to live uh, in his studio. And they do have uh, several kids. They have about three children together. Now, Matisse was patronized by the Stein family. Uh, Leo, Gertrude, and Michael, brothers and sister were extremely important patrons to these young artists, Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso. And when we look at uh, this painting, for instance, um, this was called by Leo Stein the nastiest smear of paint he had ever seen. He told people he would need time to get used to looking at this painting. But he, along with his family, purchased this and several other works uh, we see it on the back wall here of Gertrude Stein's apartment. And just knowing that these paintings are probably worth about $20 million each, it's just amazing the insight that these individuals had knowing that these artists were extremely special and doing something new and something that would be appreciated later on in history. Like many artists, of French descent, such as Delacroix, Matisse would make trips to North Africa, particularly to the French colony of Algeria. And we have uh, Delacroix's Woman of Algiers, where he's painting really a whole bunch of patterns. We see patterns everywhere on the back wall, in the clothing, on the textiles, and on the pillows and such. There's also a really high amount of color compared to normal European type paintings. And that's what many of these visits did, was it really inspired these French artists to break out and try new things. With this still life by Matisse, he paints a prayer mat, which serves as backdrop and also uh, as a tablecloth 
for these objects. This is one of the three prayer mats he brings back from one of his trips to uh, Algeria. And we see that with this painting that it includes not only other still life objects such as a vase and fruit, but we also have a sculpture there in the left hand corner. This is a sculpture done by Matisse and it's real common for him to have finished a sculpture such as this and then it winds up in a painting of around the same time period. And again, we see this throughout Matisse's career. Now this painting is important. It's a little bit older than the others I've shown you. This one's done around 1925. And the figure of the woman is so incredibly different compared to what we had seen previously. Many people argue that it was based on this figure here, again, a sculpture completed in the early 1920s. But I argue that it's a lot more like this figure, a tumba, which is a funerary or reliquary figure that we see from uh, the Congo area of Africa. That all of a sudden, instead of Matisse incorporating objects from his trips, that instead it's actually touched him on a deeper level and stylistically his artwork has changed. Now again you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of pattern, a tremendous amount of fabrics used in these paintings. And Matisse came from a textile producing town in northern France. He loved textiles. This one was his favorite though. Uh, if you go to the Matisse Museum today, uh, you'll be able to see this swatch of fabric. And Matisse says that he saw this in a window of a secondhand store as he was passing by on a bus. And he got off the bus, ran inside, and he bought this work. And this ends up being the basis, or at least a large part, for so many of his early paintings of the early 1900s. We have the still life here where... Again, like the prayer mat, it serves as a backdrop as well as a tablecloth. It helps us to eliminate linear perspective, the idea that we only get to see a little bit of the room in the right-hand corner of this painting. With the painting of Pierre Matisse, now this is a portrait of his beloved son, yet one more foot in Pierre isn't even in this painting. It's all about that fabric, and here it's being used as a tablecloth underneath this cyclamen flower. Probably his most noted work is Harmony in Red, and this is a painting that wasn't even, at first, Harmony in Red. It was Harmony in Green, and Matisse didn't care for it very much, so he changed the color and repainted it to Harmony in Blue. After that, he sold it to a Russian collector, asked for the painting back. It was reluctantly given back to him, and he repainted it a third time to Harmony in Red. Now, red is uh, an extremely vibrant color. It's a very passionate color, and it works very, very well with this painting, uh, which you can see at the Hermitage today. But it is, again, that famous cloth that he used, but he's using arbitrary color. Instead of white, it's red. But you can see the design is exactly the same, and it works well in terms of eliminating the idea of linear perspective. Because here in this painting, it looks extremely flat. We don't know where the wallpaper really kind of comes to an end and the tablecloth begins. Also, at the left-hand side, we have this image that looks like an abstract painting or maybe it's just an abstract image of the outside world. Maybe it is a window. We're just not quite sure. Matisse is very commonly putting paintings within paintings, just like he did sculpture within paintings. The odalisques here um, come from the 1920s, um, again using textiles as the background and as the flooring. Now during the early part of the 1920s, the Ballet Russe, the Russian ballets, 
were very, very common throughout Europe. And Sergi Diaghilev was the founder of the Ballet Russe, and he hired modernist artists such as Dorat and Picasso and Matisse to not only complete the costumes, but also the background sets for these ballets. Matisse worked on one called Le Chant de Rosignol, or translated to The Song of the Nightingale. And a lot of these costumes were destroyed during World War II, during the bombings of London. However, the largest remaining collection comes to us um, and is housed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And these costumes go for an insane amount of money. The work at the right insured insurance value is approximately $300,000. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, at the end of Matisse's career, we have him uh, succumbing to arthritis, so much so that he can't hold a paintbrush, he can't hold a pencil or a pen, but he can manipulate scissors. So his studio assistants paint construction pieces of paper with gouache, which is a painting medium comprised of watercolor and chalk. And then Matisse goes around and cuts out these organic objects, many of them looking like plant leaves and such. And then they are attached to some type of backdrop. Um, the one at the LA County Museum of Art is done on tile, others are done on fiberboard and such. But you can see here that some of these images look like coral, some of them look like plant leaves, but they are very, very outstanding. And you can see also how large this, uh, these images are, particularly in the last one we looked at, we had a person looking at it. And so it was like this one, about eight feet in terms of height. These are massive artworks. Now, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about the second part of this uh, presentation, which is cubism.